Last week we thought about being fully present to ourselves and to God, so that we in turn are ready to notice God's presence in our lives. As we begin this session, think again about how you are now fully present in your space. What grounds you? Your feet on the floor, your body in a chair? What is connecting you to the bedrock of the earth? The earth on which Jesus walked. As you get comfortable and prepare, you might like to listen to one of the music suggestions that came with this email, or you could save this for later. Of course, when we are truly present, we're not just being completely passive. Yes, we are still, but we are also aware of our surroundings. We are ready and we are waiting. Not impatiently with our foot tapping and constant glances at the time, but alert and watchful for God. Advent is, of course, the season of waiting, and learning how to wait is not always easy. Waiting is very countercultural. We live in a world in which the instant result is good. Own it now, say the adverts. Be beautiful now. Fix your garden. Fix your house. Fix your life. We are taught to want everything now, instantly. True waiting, though, is about recognising that life sometimes, or often, doesn't work like that. It's about learning the value of time. Some time ago, a group of researchers did an experiment on waiting. They put a marshmallow in front of a child and told the child they were going to be left on their own with the marshmallow for a short while. When the researcher returned, if the marshmallow was still there, the child would be rewarded with two marshmallows. So if they could wait for their treat, that treat would be increased. Of course, the children found the waiting very difficult. Some covered their eyes with their hands, rested their heads on their arms and found other ways of not looking at the marshmallow. Many seem to try to reduce the frustration of waiting by creating their own diversions. They talked to themselves, sang, invented games with their hands and feet. One even managed to fall asleep to get the waiting over quickly. And of course, some children couldn't wait and ate the marshmallow, forgoing the promised reward. How good at waiting are you? And does it make a difference when you know what you are waiting for? Sometimes we know what that is, or we think we know. But is that true waiting, or is it expectation? And is there a difference? How much is expectation something we create ourselves by thinking and wondering about the future, perhaps as a distraction from waiting? A problem with that kind of expectation is that when the future arrives, our experience of it is shaped by that expectation. We feel relief or disappointment. Perhaps we only see what we expect to see and we miss out on what is really happening. Think back to Christmases in your past. How much has your experience of Christmas been coloured by your expectations? How would you experience Christmas if you had no preconceptions, if you were encountering the season for the first time? If you were able to put aside the messaging from advertising, from friends, relatives, even from the church, and just be alert and watchful for how God might be coming to you? Of course, this isn't possible, and I wonder whether it is also unreasonable, because the coming of God is not only ahead of us, it is also behind us. Paradoxically, we can maybe know something of its strangeness, its unexpectedness, from the fact that it has already happened in a stable over 2,000 years ago. So Advent is a time of both expectation and waiting. 
expectation because we know already what Christ's coming was like. We know about the stable, the shepherds, the star and the angels. We expect to feel awe and wonder, humbled and exultant. But in Advent we are also reminded that we must learn to wait without expectation. We must wait because we do not know how or when God's plan for us and for the whole of creation will finally come about. The resources which accompany this audio include a picture called Spatial Concept Waiting, which is in the Tate Modern Gallery on the South Bank. It's by an Argentine-Italian artist called Lucio Fontana and was made in the 1960s. It depicts a beige canvas in a wooden frame. In the centre of the canvas is a slash which cuts through to a black or very dark brown background. Fontana made a number of these works in which he cut through the canvas. Some are called waiting and some expectation. In the last interview he gave before his death in 1968, Fontana said, I did not cut holes in canvases to ruin the image. On the contrary, I made holes in order to find something else. The meaning of the painting isn't obvious. We must wait with it. Are we waiting for something to break through the canvas and come to us? Is the cut the first sign that what we are waiting for is coming? Or is the cut waiting for us to peer through? The image looks violent, but in 1966 the artist created an entire room of such works, all in white, which he said gave the viewer an impression of spatial calm, of cosmic rigour, of serenity in infinity. Does this picture hold the moment when the patience of waiting, the stillness of the present moment, meets the immediacy of the future? The cut through the canvas may remind us of the veil of the temple, the symbolic barrier between heaven and earth being torn in two as Jesus died on the cross. We might think of incarnation as another of those moments when the barrier between heaven and earth was broken through. And what of the promised new creation? Will the fabric of our present reality tearing apart be the first sign of Christ's coming again? How can we wait this Advent in a way that ensures we both recognise God's presence with us now, but are also watchful for signs of its newness? How can we wait in a way that leaves our perceptions and alertness unclouded by our expectations, but still retains the hope that comes from our experience of God's self-revelation in the Incarnation? How, in other words, can we wait in a way that makes us ready for the opening of God's door in our time, our present, our here and now?